Welcome to Untold, the rise and fall of And One, recap and review, and if you're wondering, that was your spoiler warning. We began in 1994 at Wharton, an Ivy League business school attended by a kid named Seth who spent more time hooping than studying. He was an investment intern, but he hated it. He wanted a job that involved the thing that he loved most, basketball, but he couldn't do it alone. He needed a team, and he knew just who to tap, his best friend Jay and the strange cat that he hooped with named Tom. But Tom was brilliant and desperate not to wear a tie for a living too, so he was in. The fellas decided to make a basketball startup, but first they needed a name. When you make a bucket and you get fouled, you say and one. You don't say and one, you scream and one. And this is when Tom's genius first steps to the front because he grabs a napkin and jots down what would become the bulk of their iconic trash talk t-shirts. But that was enough because soon they see their shirts flying out of trunks and stores. Not only that, they were on the backs of kids in the hood, but also celebrities on TV, but they had higher aspirations. And one wanted to be a billion dollar company. But to do that, they had to take on Nike. And what would And One need to do if they wanted to be number one? We want to make the number one basketball brand in the world. We can't do that unless we do shoes. And first, their plan to beat the king was to be the king. To fight fire with fire, they needed their own Michael Jordan. And in Stefan Marbury, they found their perfect A-level baller who fit their brash image. But to land the star point guard, they basically had to bet the whole company. They signed Marbury to an unheard of 10-year deal before he even played a minute of basketball. And one released a huge ad campaign paired with their latest shoe in advance of Stefan's first game, and And one was super excited. But not for long, because during the game, Marbury goes down with a nasty ankle injury. And even more dangerous for And one as a young company. Oh my God, we just ran a breaking ankles TV campaign for Stefan Marbury. And Stefan just broke his ankle wearing our shoes. They tried to out Nike, Nike, and failed. And they thought there was no way they wouldn't go broke. That is until two weeks later when they received the tape at the office and it was something they'd never seen before. It was thousands of people at a New York City basketball court to see a kid named Skip Tamalu play ball. But his age wasn't the wildest part. It was how he played. It was more poetry in motion. It was more trickery and sorcery. I always wanted to deceive you. Third of what he's doing is illegal right here. <laughs> but I don't really think it matters. But Seth's eyes didn't deceive him. He knew a hit when he saw it and maybe a way to save his company. They realized that streetball was pure expression and artistry and the perfect counter to Nike at the time. That's when I started to understand this is the essence of who we are. We're grassroots, we're everyman basketball, we're attitude, we're raw expression, we're art. This is a strategic position that Nike can't touch. And M1's idea couldn't have come at a worse time for Nike because... I am here to, to announce my retirement from the game of basketball. The NBA lockout provided the perfect opportunity for M1 and they ran with it. They decided to recreate the experience of streetball by making their first M1 mixtape. Sway from the world famous Wake Up Show, and y'all about to view the N1 mixtape on video, coming to you live. And it was an instant success. It featured Skip to Malu, and he became a rock star overnight. Each person sharing it with another dozen or two dozen or three dozen people. We had this insane viral market in the pre-internet age. Immediately, the question was how to do volume two, and Ann One was like, why not take this thing on tour? The idea was to create a team of the best five street ballers they could find and challenge each city they went to to beat them. The first baller they selected was Main Event, and Main brought his longtime friend Shane. The team now had its heart and soul, but it needed a voice, and for that, they had the legendary Duke Tango. And they needed him too, because in the world of street ball where your name is everything, Duke Tango is the dude who gives you the name. And Duke knew a few names that needed to be on N1 too, so they used those to fill out the roster. With the N1 legends in place, it was time to hit the road, and no one knew what to expect because there was no blueprint for players who didn't make the NBA to get paid to play. But it was an instant hit. Team N1 tore through each city like paper, but something was different when they arrived in the city of Atlanta. Because unlike most other cities, Atlanta already had a certified streetball legend, Hot Sauce. And when he took the court, he showed the whole world why. Hot Sauce displayed skills that no one had ever seen before, and he became a sensation. He was a basketball genius who took streetball to another level. And the company, too. Because after Hot Sauce signed up, they all got the star treatment. People started to study his moves and copy them all over the country. At that time, I might have been the most popular basketball player on earth. And he ain't lying. 
During his run, Hot Sauce was even doing movies, and even the big boys started to take notice. The bad news was they were in Nike's crosshairs, but the good news was they were also in ESPN's. They wanted to do a reality show with Ann One where the winner would get a contract on the team. Basically, they were looking for lightning in the bottle, and they got lucky and found it in their very first city, because that's where they found a kid named Grayson, or as Duke Tango named him, And for the next 29 games, class was in session because in the end, the professor was the last contestant standing and earned a spot on the team. And when the show aired on ESPN, people went nuts. And one was the number one show on ESPN and more people were showing up to the arenas to see them than their own hometown NBA squads. And when they took the show overseas, they were shocked to find out that they were even bigger there than they were in America. Everything was first class now, including the groupies. And I ain't trying to get demonetized, so I'll just say watch the movie to see how they got down. But suffice it to say that everybody was riding the hype. And one was at the top, and there was no end in sight. They had taken it from the streets to video games, and now they were ready to take back shoes. But this time, Tom would be in charge of development, and here again, his genius came to the forefront. Tom's shoes were like something from the future, and it wasn't long before his kicks like the Tai Chi were outselling Nike. Everyone who was anyone started rocking and once, and at that year's dunk contest, one of those anyones was Vince Carter. He put on one of his most iconic performances ever, and he did it while wearing Thai cheese. Funny enough, Vince Carter was involved in the highest point for An One, but also their lowest. Because just two weeks later, Nike released a commercial starring Vince that was nothing short of an An One killer. With this incredibly beautifully shot. TV campaign. And it totally worked. But there was other trouble brewing for AM1 with the players. See, the players were treated as contractors, not employees, which meant they didn't get stock options or perks, just salary. And even worse, all the players were paid differently. Some were paid well, but most made as little as 15000 and this caused friction. The situation was so uneven that some players were still in the hood, while others could afford talking cars. But things came to a head one night when the executives were eating filet mignon and shrimp on their bus, but the players were given cheese pizza. When the players found out about it, they were incensed. Main event went off, and by the end of it, the executives ended up wearing hot pizza that night. And the jealousy amongst the players reached an insane level, which even led to physical altercations. But the downfall of Van One was complete when it came to their boy genius Tom. He'd worked for mad hours to perfect and one shoes and even moved to Asia to ensure their quality. He worked like a crazy person until he got sick and was forced to resign from the company. And after Tom dipped, the company tanked instantly and to preserve their profits, Seth and Jay sold immediately. They did it so fast that the players who had made them millions were only informed of the sale after the deal was complete. No notice. No notice. In the end, Jay, Seth, and Tom all made their millions, but their friendships were broken and the players all went their separate ways. And I think this was a dope flick. The story of Van One is something that's unique to basketball and it's a story that deserves to be told. Seeing players that I grew up with explaining the game of streetball and their passion for it was worth the watch alone, but learning about how the Van One execs jacked the players was just as important. To me, this flick works best as a cautionary tale of corporate exploitation of urban cultures. The execs here were shooting fish in the barrel while the players were acting like crabs in one, but the basketball here is pristine. Untold, the rise and fall of Anne One gets a strong recommendation and a oh baby from me. Thanks for watching Hoops and Dreams. If you dig the vibe, hit the subscribe to join the tribe. Peace.